So welcome everyone. This is a panel session of Climate Culture Peace titled Heritage as a Source of Innovation for a uh, Source of Innovation and Coping Capacities. Um, I am Marcy Rockman. I'm one of your moderators. And I'll briefly note, uh, we were originally going to have two other wonderful moderators, uh, Sarah Stanage and Mahmoud Solomon. Unfortunately, we are in a time of pandemic and extreme weather events, and they are making themselves felt today. So both Sarah and Mahmoud send their regrets, and I am grateful for your patience as we juggle some of the responsibilities. Brief introduction of me, I'm an archaeologist speaking from Washington, DC. I've held several roles here at the intersection of climate change, cultural heritage, and policy. Uh, I spent several years with the US National Park Service as their lead for heritage and climate change. And I work on how humans learn new environments. And I've had the honor of serving as scientific coordinator for climate culture peace. I'm gonna to start today with some very brief technical details. We have a session uh, that is scheduled for exactly an hour and four panel presentations and then a Q&A. And then at the sort of top of that hour, we have a multimedia presentation plan. So that will be sort of our capstone for the piece. Each presentation will be 10 minutes in length and the presenters have all been warned. They will be timed, uh, it, um, timed and they will receive a warning at two minutes out and then they'll be asked to wrap up uh, at 10 minutes. We're gonna go through all four of the presentation, panel presentations first, and then we will move to a question and answer session. If you have a question occurs to you at any time throughout uh, the session, please just put your question in the chat and we will pull from it there. And then when we're in the Q&A, you can also put it in the chat or raise your hand and we will call on you. Um, with that, let me give a brief introduction to the, the theme of this session, which is heritage as a source of innovation uh, and coping strategies. And I have to say this session itself is a bit of an innovation. It was not on our original list of topics when we were starting to pull everything together into the schedule. But as we sort of went through and we were reading particularly these four presentations, they really struck all of us as being having unique threads of different ways of working with heritage and the tools of heritage to meet emerging challenges of our world and of climate change. And so we wanted to bring them together around this theme. Uh, and so presenters, if you got this session and said, how am I having a relationship to these? It is that theme of innovation. And so you are all so different, but we, we see that spark uh, through all of them. So that's what we've brought together today. And so the questions I hope will uh, get into, we'll look maybe at the individual projects themselves, but then also the situation of innovation itself and how do we work with heritage to address all of the challenges that we're facing. With that, you don't need to hear more from me. Let's get on to our presentation. Um, our first presenter today is Mr. Tanmay Good um, from the Gujarat Institute of Disaster Management, and he will be presenting the curious case of the city called Ahmedabad. Tanmay, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Masi. Uh, I'll just share my presentation. Hope the screen is visible to everyone. Okay, thank you. Yes, we can see it. You're, you're great. Thank you. A very good, uh, good evening to all from India. Hope everyone is safe and healthy in these trying times. So without wasting much of a time, I'm uh, coming to today's topic. Today, I'm going to share with you a small research story the research has also been a part of a uh, much awaited global assessment report on disaster risk reduction 2022. Before going into details of curious case of a city called Ahmedabad, 
I would like to give some background about the study. As we have often read about India's cultural diversity, the country is truly rich in culture and traditions. With every hundred odd miles, you will find different language, culture, traditions have been followed. With this, colleagues from Gujarat Institute of Disaster Management decided to conduct the study. Interestingly, these researchers are also coming from different parts of India. One from Far East, one from Central India, one from West, and one from somewhat South, uh, South West India. These researchers have different cultural traditional backgrounds, which also influences their cultural understandings. So one of the researchers, which is me, I come from Mumbai, which is a unique city in itself. The spirit of uh, city has always been a hot topic, be it a seasonal floods uh, every year or terror attack. Social cohesion between the Mumbai's communities has always been a globally appreciated and acknowledged. During the 2020 pandemic, everyone knows how it went. So these four researchers who happened to be colleagues and being a DRM professional started discussing about the impact of the pandemic. Uh, being, being a social scientist, my inclination was always towards how the community is coping with this pandemic. To explore further, we decided to go on the ground. And the closest, closest proximity was Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad is also the first world heritage city of India, declared by UNESCO. The city is a hotspot of culture in itself. Before going into the findings and outcomes of the study, I would like to draw everyone's attention to the term called cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is usually interpreted within the box understanding of tangible and intangible, and often with religious tone, but arguably it is more than that. Cultural heritage can be said to be the collective consciousness of a community that is developed through years of experiences, relations, livelihoods, etc a culture of way of life in a particular community, which is indeed a heritage for them to preserve and fall back upon. With a curious mindset, we went to the field. As mentioned earlier, by profession, we are disaster risk managers. So we are obliged to follow Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And accordingly, to, according to its priority one, understanding risk, we started to explore the site, the old city of Ahmedabad. Interestingly, the city of Ahmedabad has been described as, unlike Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, and Kanpur, Ahmedabad was not a creation of the British, but a city, city which, while remaining true to itself, successfully adapted to the new industrial age, carrying over commercial and industrial skills and patterns of traditional social organization. There were a series of events in, in the 19th century which intensified the growth of the city from the emergence of the municipal commission in 1857. There was always an influx of migrants from the surroundings, uh, surrounding villages, which created a demand, of, a demand for housing. The density kept rising as the houses were subdivided to fulfill its, this growing demand for housing. The average density in the walled city reached to 220,000 persons per square mile with the certain neighborhoods having a density as high as 3,50,000 per square uh, mile by 1971. The rising congestion and the declining lively, li uh, living conditions saw the elite in the city move out of the suburbs. These development activities were driving factors of the shaping of the old city of Ahmedabad. To understand the impact of COVID-19 on the city in a constructive manner, we followed the system thinking approach. We identified 10 sibling systems as shown in the diagram. We tried to understand the interaction between social sibling systems like that, uh, like that of culture and relations, religion and religious practices, business and economy, infrastructure, etc. These interactions were driven by other sibling systems like governance and have had a significant contribution towards the building of systemic risk which manifested as the effects and impacts of COVID-19. After a long dis uh, discussion among the researchers, uh, we were finally able to establish a social sibling system state diagram. As shown here, you can see 
there are interdependencies in these systems which affect another system negatively and positively at times just looking at the diagram one can understand systems are highly interdependent and risk created within these systems are not easy to understand especially when risk is systemic and chronic in nature while is built over the period as we are going ahead in globalization and trying to connect everything with the palm i mean mobile and tablets try to solve every problem through an app drm professionals are also inclined towards assess the risk uh, through some tool or an app but believe me it is not easy as it seems while understanding risk everything was happening like uh, an inception movie the christopher nolan movie the risk uh, were too complex to understand alas not every everything was bad as or as complicated interestingly we could find the, some systemic capacities which led to better management and co uh, containment of covid 19 for example when the availability of basic necessities was compromised that particular sibling system was reinforced by other sibling systems like that of governance culture and religions and also religion and religious practices when other sibling systems fail there is one sibling system that often appears as a positive reinforcer culture and relations this sibling system reinforce public health business economy and basic necessity local level healthcare etc albeit at times there were pertinent negative influences but largely they were positive in retrospection it is easy to conclude that the years of experiences these communities had shared together they experiences this uh, incredible in which their livelihoods remained intertwined led to the very social, strong social cohesion their collective con uh, consciousness a culture in its own right helped the helped the uh, community at large to remain afloat this living heritage played an important role in the management of the risk and until and unless the whole scenario is analyzed through the system approach this would have never come out as as a local saying goes chitu chidni chinta kare krishna ne karbu ne karbu hoye te kare which means oh hard why are you worrying krishna will do what he wishes to and this is what powered the community at large by serving support to each other in all forms social so, uh, psychological and financial this is what the cultural heritage of city is not inclined towards caste divides or not aligned to communal and religious divides unfortunately the limited understanding to uh, tangible and intangible elements of cultural heritage does not permit to culture uh, look cultural heritage as the collective consciousness of a community risk management of cul cultural heritage is often talk about in terms of risk management of sites and precincts and cultural heritage is disaster management has always been limited to the use of traditional and indi indigenous knowledge but perhaps it is high time to look at cultural heritage as the ways of life of people in a community this is one of uh, one aspect that is rarely accounted for in risk informed decision making systemic capacity of a community are overlooked system uh, whereas systemic risk are super, uh, superficially overvalued thus there is an ar uh, urgent need to mainstream cultural heritage into the fundamentals of risk informed sustainable development for a decision to be in risk informed systemic risk needs to be looked at which would in instinctively draw in the systemic capacity of community developed through years of shared experiences which is cultural heritage so coming to the conclusion the tendency to romanticize the concept of mainstream in cultural heritage into risk informed sustainable development needs to be done away with moving away from the semantics towards the action a point to be noted here is that for a decision to be risk informed systemic risk needs to be looked at which would instinctively draw in the uh, systemic capacity of a community developed through years of experience uh, and integrated into disaster risk reduction strategies at the local level thank you that's it from my side thank you
Thank you so much, Tammy. And that was perfectly timed, <laughs> absolutely spot on. And I think I want to go back and look at your amazing wiring diagram yeah, yeah. as well. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really incredible. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So that's shall, it, shall I stop my screen? <laughs> Um, I think we'll move to the next one, but we may come back to that to ask you some more questions. Fascinating. Our next presentation is by Mr. Alex DeGiorgi, uh, who is with the Alta Heritage Foundation in California, and he will be presenting on disaster archaeology, adapting archaeological methods to recover human cremated remains from catastrophic wildfire areas. Alex, over to you. Uh, let's see. Can everyone see that? Yes, you are up and in show mode. Great. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever in the world you may be. Today I'll be talking about using archaeological methods to search for human cremated remains within wildfire disaster areas. California is currently in the midst of a record-setting drought. <clears throat> the drought that began in 2012 now includes the lowest calendar year and 12-month precipitation, the highest annual temperature, and the most extreme drought indicators on record. The American desert and the West Coast are drier than at any other time in the past 400 years. This graph shows the number of fires burned by wildfire, the number of acres burned by wildfire per year in California over a 32 year period. Fires are growing in frequency and size. In 2020, uh, the 2020 fire season broke numerous records Five of California's largest fires in modern history burned at the same time, destroying thousands of buildings, forcing hundreds of thousands to flee their homes, and exposing millions of residents to dangerously unhealthy air. More than four million acres burned across the state, double the previous record. The satellite image on the right shows the campfire which destroyed the town of Paradise in Northern California and killed 84 people. The graphic on the left depicts active wildfires burning across California in the fall of 2020. In California, it is now common for a single wildfire to encompass over 1 million acres of land. Whole communities are being destroyed. These areas were previously thought to be safe against wildfire. This image shows the aftermath of a wildfire that destroyed part of the city of Santa Rosa in Northern California. This is my hometown. When wildfire destroys a home, it results in virtually complete loss. The entire building is reduced to a few inches of ashes. Oftentimes, families keep the cremated remains of previously deceased family members within their home in urns or other vessels. These remains may become lost amid the destruction of the burnt home. Oh, I, I skipped ahead on a slide. Okay, so uh, this woman <clears throat> lost the ashes of her late husband when her home was destroyed. Because of their significance to the surviving family members, human cremated remains are endowed with significant sentimental meaning. The loss of these memorials contributes to the emotional trauma suffered by wildfire victims. Alta Heritage Foundation is a nonprofit volunteer group of archeologists and specially trained dogs that work within wildfire disaster areas to help fire victims recover the cremated remains of family members. To be clear, we are not looking for individuals who died as a result of the fire 
We are searching for the remains of individuals who died, were cremated, and whose ashes were kept by family members as an heirloom. Oh, okay. Wildfire disaster scenes are chaotic and complicated. At first, attempting to recover a small amount of human cremains from the expansive ashes of a burnt building may seem futile. Recovery of cremains from wildfire disaster areas is something that has not previously been attempted at any large scale. The methods for implementing such efforts were improvised and refined through practice. Through the course of these efforts, a general approach emerged. First, we used human detection dogs to search the site. Human detection dogs can be specifically trained to follow the scent of cremated human remains in order to locate the source. Whether the cremains are on the surface, buried underground, or by debris, a dog's nose is powerful enough to pick up the scent and trace it back to its source. Human detection dogs or sniffer dogs have played an important role in disaster response for decades, with their keen sense of smell being harnessed to aid investigations. The average human being has roughly 5 million sensitive cells within the nose to aid scent detection. This appears to be a large number un until compared to the 200 million cells in the dog's nose. Further, increasing the dog's sense of smell is an organ in the roof of the mouth, not present in humans, which essentially allows the dog to taste a smell, thus strengthening its ability to detect odors. With the heightened sense of smell, the air is full of a vast variety of different odors, many of which will be powerfully clear to the dog. The dog will alert by laying down when it detects the scent of human remains. Then a second dog performs a search of the site. This provides verification of the approximate location of the remains. <clears throat> Archaeological skills originally intended for studying the past are adapted to address contemporary issues and solve problems thrust upon us by climate change. Unlike a traditional archaeological investigation, where the site being studied is, is ancient and the individuals associated with the site are long departed, Cremain's recovery involves living persons that survived a wildfire disaster. Interviews with wildfire survivors provide essential information, influence how the field work is approached, and can affect the outcome of the recovery effort. Basic information gathered through interviews, such as what are we looking for, where in the site to search, and identification of associated artifacts are fundamental evidence to guide the fieldwork, ultimately leading to a successful recovery. Here, volunteer archaeologists are working to recover the ashes of a man who was killed at age 25 and whose remains were kept in his mother's home. <clears throat> Human cremated remains have a distinct color and texture that is different than ordinary building debris. Here you can see a complete set of human remains lying on the surface within the rubble of a devastated building. This is three sets of cremains that have been successfully excavated. The United States regulates uh, United States regulations require that all human cremated remains include a metal medallion. This medallion has a unique number that associates it with the individual. Here is a medallion that we found while recovering human ash. This new application of archaeology fulfills an impen important and previously unrecognized need. Since our inaugural project, Alta Heritage Foundation's recovery team has worked within wildfires in California and Oregon 
excavating over 300 burned buildings or sites, resulting in the recovery of hundreds of individual sets of cremated remains. Archaeology can play an important and active role in the recovery process following a wildfire disaster event. As archaeologists engage their expertise and training as recovery workers, their efforts can be instrumental in providing closure for wildfire victims by reuniting them with their loved ones. As climate change emerges as the signature global issue of this century, archaeologists will become increasingly involved in recovery efforts following these mass disaster events. And I, I want to thank everyone for your attention today. Uh, this is the webpage of our nonprofit organization. I've uh, provided my email contact information at the bottom right of the page. And uh, I hope you will reach out to me uh, with any questions or, or comments. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alex. And again, you are also absolutely spot on time. That was beautifully done um, and beautifully Thank timed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is there a way to, do I need to stop sharing? I think if you go up to the top of your screen, there should be a stop, a red stop sharing little tab. There you go. Thank you. You got it. <laughs> well done. Great. Our next presentation is by Ms. Sharzad. I mean, Shirazi, um, who is with the Research Center for Conservation of Cultural Relics in Iran, in Iran, and she'll be presenting the Salt Men of Iran Cultural Heritage as a Driver and Enabler of Sustainable Development and Growth. Sharzad, over to you. I think you're on mute. Thank you. There yeah. You are. Thank you, Marty, and uh, thank you from all the CCP team. Uh, in this presentation, I, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Marichi Yoshida and uh, Natasha Bagarpur, uh, I'm going to present some insight of international conference, uh, uh, some, oh, okay. Okay, some, uh, insight of international cooperation between German and Iranian teams in protecting cultural heritage as a shared responsibility. In time of political tensions, economic crisis caused by sanctions and global pandemic. Uh, okay. There you go. Yeah. Salt one of the most essential resources of the world, which can be obtained in various ways. And there is the salt mine of Chehrabad near Hamzalu village in Zanjan, Iran, that has been known as a salt uh, mining site since the ancient times and where our story begins. First salt mine was founded unexpectedly in 1993. Soon the scientific investigations revealed that this was an, a man who died 1,800 years ago in a mine accident. These findings encouraged archaeological excavations in salt mine and led to finding seven other salt mummies up to the present. Significance in findings made authorities to shut down mining activity in mine and mine became a cultural site with limited access to only to researchers. This changed, relation, this changed the relationship of local community and the mine. Now they have to take care of the mine, which once took care of their livelihood. Salt didn't solely preserve the human remains. Archaeological finds from the mine shows a vast spectrum of other organic objects which together with mummies make a valuable resource in studying ancient lifestyle of human in a very extended period of time. Seeking the better preservation and also in favor of continuing researches, mummies and collection moved to Zanjan, the capital city of the province, 
to be kept in the uh, and exhibited in archaeological museum which itself was uh, located in a historical building it was as it was expected the saltman and the collection soon turned to be one of the most interesting and popular tourist attractions not only for iranian but also for tourists from all over the globe but what they see now in the museum are some objects and natural mummified bodies out of their archaeological context. To providing the, uh, this vision with possibility to connect uh, better with collections, a redesigning project by Iranian architects funded by Gerda Henkel Institute. To obtaining a comprehensive conservation management plan for the collection and museum, an interdisciplinary series of workshops was organized where experts from different cultural and research institutions came together to discuss the relevant aspects of preventive conservation and agree on priorities. Accordingly, climate stability and pest management were identified as urgent topics but fire safety and light protection were also put on the agenda to be improved successfully. Monitoring plan was developed and improvement measures extracted based on this data and implementation step by step. As a side effect, the findings from the inspection at the museum also led to possibility of raising further funds from, uh, for renewing the outdated electric in the museum building, which were assessed by ma uh, as major priorities. Conservation measures and preservation concepts always have to be considered in a wide context of stakeholders, involving also interest groups beyond the museum, as cultural heritage should connect to all people and not only to a selected culturally educated group. Ultimately, it is not the technology and science that preserve cultural heritage, but people, their appreciation and their will. Therefore, a holistic preservation concept has to be people-centered and address them at different levels and activate them in different ways. 2,500 years ago, the 50-year-old miner started his last day of life at the salt mine. Today, his story is narrative of the exhibition Death in the Salt at the German Mining Museum, that based on the archaeological investigations, tries to reconstruct last day of his life. A graphical novel helps convey the dramatic subject to a wider audience, inviting them to imagine the object in a context of an ancient world and to connect themselves emotionally to this young miner. In 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, the Saltman project was gifted with another funding from the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Under the title Conserving the Saltman of Zanjan in Iran, Restoration and Research of the salt men in the exhibition could be continued in an open lab. Due to the pandemic, museum also in Iran were closed, but the team opened up the lab in a virtual room on Instagram to the public. Within four months, the salt man of Iran could attract thousand followers all over the world, but mostly in Iran, showing how interested the young community is in their cultural heritage. The salt mummies in the exhibition might have a frightening, a fascinating, and maybe even a scary effect on children and young adults. But telling a story about the young miner, giving him a friendly face and a voice may connect the young people to the salt man as a human. So the project also includes the production of a book for young adult telling a fictive story of a young miner based on archaeological facts and paint games and puzzles with saltman theme are also developed for children. Currently, a traditional puppet play is created. This kind of play itself is an intangible heritage that threatens to disappear more and more from our modern society. 
Recruiting the salt man as human being is also a topic of an ethic discussion forum, which is also part of the Open Lab. 11 interdisciplinary experts from Iran, Germany, Austria, South Tyrol, and Switzerland, all having worked with human remains, discuss about the challenge and responsibility to preserve them as cultural heritage on controversies in the science and humanities toward the mummified bodies and skeletal remains, and function of the salt man as a storyteller and cultural, cultural influencer in social media. Consumering the salt man therefore goes beyond the examination of the physical matter and its environment, and considers also the societal environmental uh, environment and activate, activates a wider community to engage with salt man heritage. Preservation only works as long as the village remains as caretaker of salt mine. However, life is difficult in the region, as salt on the one hand, an important livelihood, is on the other hand, the reason for high chloride content in the water, making water supply for the people difficult. So another project, Water Education and Tourism in Rural Mahnesham region, Iran, also founded by German Gerda Henkel Stiftung. It aims to find new water sources to install wells and support local people to develop new water management concepts. Current efforts by stakeholders are aimed at developing an education and community center in Hanseli where people can learn more about cultural and natural resource management. Water management organize local and international meetings, host regional guests and international tourists, and guide them to the archaeological site and accommodate researcher teams staying in the village for the excavation season. Saltmen who lost their lives in, in, in the mine some thousand years ago left us a heritage which connects us to ancient societies. They open our eyes for their cultural achievements and tremendous resilience that has carried out over into today's society, teaching us respect for nature and humility toward all the uh, creatures of life. Excavating, researching, and conserving the cultural heritage of Prehrabad mine connects us to the local society as responsible partners to pass on the history of the saltmen to future generations. This project made a way for people of different cultural backgrounds to get closer and experience how the cultural heritage can act as an element without borders to make understanding, tolerance, and peace possible. Funds from outside make it possible for Iranian experts to show their ability and expertise actively in safeguarding cultural heritage and make new bonds with them and their counterparts from other parts of the world. So although in time of crisis, cultural heritage can easily lose the battle of being among the priorities in national strategic plans, but will never lose its capacity to affect positively on the people life. It brings peace, mutual understandings and give us the strength to survive. Culture will conquer all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherzad. Also beautifully timed and beautifully presented. Um, I want to see more of, uh, more of the display and learn more about them. Um, and the, the figures are very engaging. So thank you so much. Um, our fourth and final presentation of this section uh, is presented by Ms. Aziza Chawoni, uh, who is joining us from Toronto, I believe, and she will be speaking on the oasis of Mohammed El Shulain in the face of climate change. Aziza, over to you. Sorry, I guess I have a problem with my screen sharing. If you can just give me one second. I'm sorry. No about worries. That. 
Yeah, let's me let me see if it will work now. <laughs> Sorry, it's just working. Before. You had it before. Just take yeah, take the time you need to share. It's fine. Yeah, let me just see. Sorry about that. So tell me if, if you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Yeah. That's perfect. Excellent. Is that fine? Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much perfect. for having me in this very interesting session. I am uh, calling you from uh, Morocco uh, oh. right now, where I am from. Um, I am a professor of architecture at the University of, of Toronto. Uh, this is my hometown of Fez, but today I won't be speaking about Fez, but I'll be speaking about a project in the Saharan desert of Morocco. Uh, indeed, Morocco is covered uh, more than 50% of it by uh, the Sahara desert, uh, which is uh, in the past decade has been suffering from a lot of uh, pressure due to climate change, lack of uh, precipitation, Um, what I'll be focusing on is the project located in, in the Dra Valley uh, that's uh, being uh, fed, it's a watershed fed by the Morocco's longest river, uh, the Dra River, which is a thousand kilometers long. And you can see here the watershed of the Dra Valley here, uh, which is, um, you know, which is fed by water from the high Atlas Mountains that's coming down all the way to the Saharan Desert. And it's a very beautiful UNESCO biosphere that was named in 2001. Uh, it's a date palm valley that you can see here, which is truly magnificent can find 18 type of date palm trees um, and you know like unfortunately um, mainly due to climate change and other type of pressures that I'm going to be discussing the cultural heritage uh, both immaterial and material of this uh, valley has been slowly vanishing um, so the dry valley that, that you can see here is composed of uh, 300 kilometers of uh, continuous date palm cultivation um, as well as um, the villages that we call the Xors that are uh, built in round earth, composed of this uh, courtyard buildings called the Kasbas, um, which unfortunately has been uh, slowly uh, disappearing due to uh, erosion uh, and lack of maintenance because the population has been moving uh, away. Um, to city centers, and mainly because this agriculture that you can see here, which is used to be the main source of livelihood of the population, uh, has been suffering from lack of water, and so population of farmers have been moving away to, to cities. So I want to come back for a second to this uh, oasis agriculture, um, which uh, in a sense, because of its very vivid uh, contrast with its very arid uh, surroundings might seem almost like a, a mirage. A lot of people do think that an oasis is uh, simply like a natural occurrence. I very often like to share this little slide from uh, Tintin, I don't know if you know Tintin, uh, where he, uh, it's uh, Tintin in the Pays de l'Ornoir, where he has a mirage and he says, you know, like an oasis. And this is, you know, kind of a cliche because an oasis is absolutely not a natural, you know, like occurrence. It's the result of very, very, um, you know, like uh, hard work uh, and also century old knowledge, uh, both in planting, but mainly in uh, irrigation. So an oasis is, an, is a man-made uh, landscape and it's a productive uh, landscape. So uh, if, unfortunately, due to uh, decreasing water uh, resources, due to climate change and also over pumping of, of the water table, the oasis ha has been unfortunately not looking like this anymore, but has been looking like this. And that led also to rural uh, f f f exodus. So the Dra Valley has been um, actually the victim of a series of several droughts. Some years were not even a single drop of water. So the those very beautiful um, villages along the, the Dra Valley in round earth um, has been uh, today, a lot of them have been looking like this. So if they're not maintained, uh, it's round earth is completely organic. So 
return to the ground, they just melt away. Um, and, and actually it's a um, century old knowledge of architecture and construction that is uh, slowly, you know, kind of being, um, you know, um, disappearing. And those villages, uh, for the people that actually do remain in those villages, I would say that 50% of them uh, abandon them even and build constructions like this that you can see in cinder blocks. They're not suited whatsoever to uh, uh, the um, hot climate of the um, Dra Valley. Another uh, cause of damage of this um, heritage of, you know, of agricultural heritage and architectural heritage is the uh, appearance of this very predatory type of tourism that you can see here with very big hotels built in concrete with air conditioning, with gigantic pools that have been over pumping water from the water table and uh, activities that are not suited to the uh, fragile desert ecosystem. Uh, like uh, quad, etc. So you know, like unfortunately today, the the um, you know, like many of those uh, uh, villages actually uh, are completely ghost uh, villages. Uh, fortunately, some of them do remain um, lively. And and what I forgot to mention is that when those villages disappear, it's not just the agriculture and the architecture; it's also the actual culture. And uh, my you know, interest as a scholar uh, of architecture, uh, of, of uh, built heritage, and, and also as a practitioner of architecture was how can an architect act uh, you know, against this uh, almost, uh, you know, like, um, you know, like I would say, uh, you know, like um, action of climate that no one could stop. Um, and um, as, as I was doing research on the architecture along the Dra Valley, I came across the last village of the Dra Valley called Hamid Fel uh, So it's the last village and it received the least amount of water because a series of dams were built, you know, like along the Dra Valley to protect it against floods. And as you know, like as a result, Hamid gets the least amount of water. And when I uh, visited Hamid, I met a local, um, uh, you, you know, I would say, um, activists, environmental uh, activists, Halim Sbay, and uh, together we started thinking about how what is the, the best way to develop like a pilot project, even if it's very small, but one that can demonstrate that, uh, you know, uh, architecture, traditional architecture can still remain comfortable, but one that could preserve the uh, culture of, of the place because a lot of people are living and taking with them the, the culture of the region. And so um, Hamid, uh, you know, like at the time, was first started working there in 2009, uh, two thirds of its uh, population had left to city centers for work and leaving behind uh, for older population, uh, kids and also uh, women. And another thing is that at least 30% of its, you know, Oasis land has disappeared. So you can see here in this map, uh, the what remained of the agricultural land and in dark brown, the uh, villages that compose the Oasis from Hamid Lani's land. But what makes it really, really uh, unique, this is what we discovered, is that its uh, musical heritage is unique across Morocco because Hamid was at the intersection of the gold and salt roads and so that made its music with um, sub-Saharan uh, influences, Arabic and Berber uh, influences. So what we also uh, found out is that the younger generation was disconnected from this unique heritage and so Hamid which has about 2,000 youth um, you know did not know much about this uh, heritage. So we thought that this would be the right tool uh, to uh, integrate heritage uh, preservation of architecture, of musical heritage, but also the environment. And um, we've embarked in a project, uh, which, uh, like a pilot project to create a music school to, that would act, have many roles that, you know, like I'm gonna discuss shortly, that one of them was to um, document all of the music heritage that exists in Hamid Lani's land, often with singers and dancers that were in their 80s. And the, the goal of the Judor Sahara, which means roots of the Sahara uh, Music School was uh, music education, uh, anti desertification implementation and education and also sustainable uh, tourism uh, to counteract those very predatory forms that I just showed you. And in some ways to keep this model also self-sustaining economically. 
Um, I won't get into the details, but for each one of these goals, we've set up a set of, of different tools. And I'm gonna just show you some of them uh, in the remaining minutes of my presentation. One of them was um, collaborative design. So we worked, we developed tools to design the school. Uh, and its activities with the local uh, children. And the rule was if children were to attend the free music school, they had to partake in planting, um, you know, for the anti-desertification system. And we um, only worked with uh, local materials, rammed earth, stone, uh, bamboo. Um, and at the end, we came up with the design that's at the end of the oasis so that Really, it's at the edge of where the sand dunes are advancing. And we're a system that mixes um, landscape and architecture, both of them working together against the advancement of the sand dunes. And we propose a series of uh, programs that can support the music school and also the sustainable tourism, guest rooms, auditorium recording studio, classrooms, um, of course. Uh, but also all this architecture is intermingled uh, with experimental gardens, with our permaculture garden that brought back the um, traditional forms of agriculture. Uh, and of course, this anti-desertification system, which we already built and tested, that I want to show you, that's composed of rammed earth walls, woven uh, palm tree leaves to hold the sand dunes and planting of tamarix trees using this innovative system called the water box that allows for the uh, less evaporation and, and the trees to survive. Uh, some of the views of the uh, school um, and even the architecture, as I mentioned, is a contributor to fighting against desertification with the planting of tamarix trees in courtyards, examples of the permaculture garden. And finally, where we stand uh, today. So the music school has existed for four years as a program. Um, supported by the Playing for Change Foundation. And we have tested the anti desertification system. So this is how they started, and this is how they are today with the permaculture in three years. And we started the building of the first building here, which is a habitable water reservoir, um, which uh, technically uh, uh, stores water. Um, and um, above it, uh, we have a classroom that's naturally uh, cooled down by the, by the water from below. This is the view of the uh, first reservoir, and this is it right now under construction. And um, um, finally, uh, just very quickly to um, finish, the you know like our idea was was hopefully that this pilot project would come to replace the, those hotels that exist inside the oasis that are actually right now because of COVID all closed down. And hopefully this would create a new uh, virtual uh, cycle inside the oasis where the traditional archi um, agriculture would come back as well as the architecture. So I just wanna close by showing you the website of the project where we have put online already all of the uh, documentation of the musical heritage with translations and music that you can listen to hopefully in your free time and discover Mohamed Lerizlan and its heritage. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Aziza. I think what you just captured there, um, starting with an architectural question and then solving it, addressing it with music. Um, that was definitely something that said, that's innovative. That's not a direction I would have immediately gone. And so I think you just presented that really beautifully. I wish I could go see it in person to go do that. Please come, um, please. <laughs> yeah, it's on, definitely. Me. Yeah, on my list. Absolutely. I would love to. Um, these were just four wonderful presentations. Um, and we have a, a few minutes to go into some questions. I'm seeing a few coming into the chat. Um, what I'm going to do is take moderator's prerogative and ask one uh, to start. And actually, this is to bring all of them through. I think what jumped out at me listening to all of your presentations was that power of human connection. And most of them had some material pathway for that human connection. Um, the Saltman uh, Museum had that pathway with Alex. It's the Cremains. Um, Aziza just showed us the the oasis uh, intersecting with the music. And I wanted to actually ask Tan May, um, cause you had all of these, you were talking about the importance of social connections, but I wanted to actually ask, is there anything in the architecture or the setting of a metabod 
that really supported all those connections. And my apologies if I didn't catch it when you said it, I think I was looking at my timer, but I was wondering if there was a material component that really helped support or really help those human connections that you were seeing to grow. And then any other comments that anyone has on that? Baton May. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there was no, not a single uh, materialistic uh, thing to follow it. But uh, if uh, like I could uh, read in the chat, uh, if I can show you the, the diagram you mentioned. The <laughs> there was definitely a request uh, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention and connect to the answer. Uh, I'll show you uh, the diagram. Uh, hope everyone can see that. So yes. what I was uh, saying that due, due to time limits, I couldn't cover this, uh, the uh, diagram in, in detail. So here you can see the like COVID-19's impact is like everyone is aware about. Uh, the Every system was collapsing in at, at least in India, the uh, public health, education and everything. But the one thing which we could notice that the here you can see the culture and relation. It, it, the system, culture and relation system was actually impacting or affecting the other systems positively, where everyone was like, here you can see the uh, positive impact uh, showed in green and the negative in the red. So here the culture and relations, uh, which come not in a day or two, it's a, a long run process of uh, years of shared experience together. So it was affecting the basic necessities or a public health in a positive manner. So we could find out the uh, positive impact generated through the culture and uh, relations shared together by the communities. So unfortunately, it's a very intangible or uh, a intangible element of cultural heritage. But uh, yeah, it is very important according to us uh, to address this issue or uh, identify this. And for a long example, time. Can you zoom in on, on the diagram if it's possible? I don't, I, 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 Do you I don't mind know. if you can zoom in? I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Uh, can you? No. Uh, you as of it? now, I couldn't. Uh, I have to stop. I think if you go out, I mean, if you escape and yeah, you yeah, remain yeah. on the slide, you can ah, uh, zoom yeah. in from the slide yeah. itself. Yes, I'll do that. Now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So here you can see the culture and relations. Yeah. There you go. How it is affecting the public health, the basic necessities. Yeah. And eventually the business yeah. and economy. Yeah. yeah it, it was actually a driving factor to maintain the balance in the very hard, hard times. So the the study was a bit hard and uh, very academic in nature, but I tried my best to simplify it. Uh, yeah, you can see here yeah, the healthcare system yeah. is also affected positively. And and Marcy, can I ask a question to the other uh, panelists? And just I'd be very curious to know as we compare our project. Um, how did the, let's say, the uh, initiation of the, let's say, um, the direction of the project uh, proceed? Because in my case, I started working in this region in 2009 as an architect from a perspective of an architect thinking that architecture rehabilitation was the only thing that could be done. And then suddenly I realized that in such context, uh, it was much complex problem that you could not just resolve one thing, they were all interconnected. And the music in a way emerged uh, by working with the community, by asking questions, because we tried from a tourist angle, but uh, tourism was seen so negatively by the local community that it was not the, the right way to approach the problem or involve the local population in this change. So I'd be very curious to know if you had also this uh, iterative process where some of our first hypotheses failed, and finally, and it's really a slow process. I mean, truly it's from 2009 until today. Uh, we just, I mean, the music program is three years old now, almost four years. We just doing our first building. Um, it took us four years to do this test, you know, for the permaculture. So uh, what is in a way your relationship to time, but also to the uh, process that it, is it a linear, was it a linear process for your project or iterative process?
I'll, I'll chime in on that. You know, uh, in, in my instance, uh, I got engaged with the Cremains Recovery Project uh, through uh, a, a wildfire disaster that devastated our town. And it, disasters really pull communities together. Everybody wants to volunteer. And, uh, you know, trying to volunteer at the local shelter or the Salvation Army, um, they were turning away volunteers. There were so many people wanting to help. So I came, I, I discovered this thing almost by accident uh, through a friend who had family members' ashes that were missing. And that, that you know, so we applied the, our, our training and skills to this problem. So it, it really developed organically. And, and through this process, it, it's really been an intuitive process. Uh, one, to understand the problem. Two, to figure out the methods. Uh, three, to really understand what the long range goals of this thing should be uh, to really address the larger issues uh, surrounding this and, and understanding the complexity of the problem. So it's been intuitive and, and we're in the midst of, of learning always. Yeah. Uh, and uh, talking about the Saltman project, uh, I think the motivation for the, if, uh, designing such a, a great variety of uh, projects, uh, people-centered projects uh, to help the, the cultural heritage of Saltman uh, begins uh, where we uh, notice that uh, putting the title of a cultural heritage site on mine is not enough to protect it because uh, people did not connect with it when it's closed and uh, they think that maybe uh, uh, some treasures are hidden in it. So maybe it, uh, it uh, give them uh, some uh, idea to go and uh, go, for, uh, go for goals and something else. And uh, they, uh, in fact, they didn't believe that this cultural heritage are belong to them. Um, at the beginning, the cultural heritage belongs to the museum and people did not connect to them. So they are not sharing uh, in uh, conservation uh, activities. They are not uh, taking part uh, to uh, accept responsibility of preserving uh, cultural heritage. So step by a step by different projects, uh, we can show them how cultural heritage of the mine and salt uh, men can affect positively on their uh, livings. And it encourage them to uh, feel uh, the same as researcher, archeologists and uh, uh, conservation conservators that come to the site and uh, um, do uh, their jobs. It was uh, how the RS project is, uh, starts. I have one, I have another question that I'm, I'm sorry, does someone else have a question? Okay. I was wondering, uh, Sharzad, if I could follow up on that and uh, that question about sort of the process of building, I'm curious about partnerships of you have an idea and then I think each of you have, you're coming from some organizations or Alex, you've built one. And I'm just curious if you can describe a bit about what it was like to reach out and did partnerships come together easily? Were there some challenges? There's the proverbial issue of funding. You know, how does that shape um, or feed into your idea and, and growing your project? Well, um, absolutely, it's not, uh, it was not a simple uh, job to do. Uh, you know, uh, organizational hierarchy in Iran, like other cultural uh, institutions in other parts of the world are very tight and uh, we are uh, not in a playing in common ground uh, we conservator, archaeologists, and authorities. Uh, so uh, we are we are all uh, speak with our own 
different language about one topic. So uh, when we add uh, German counterparts and German partners to this uh, um, situation, it um, add up uh, some complication. But uh, fortunately, with good uh, um, wills, we uh, overcome all the differences and uh, we can make a good partnership with uh, within Iran, institutions in Iran and institutions in Germany and Europe. And uh, I really thank my uh, <clears throat> fellow colleagues in this project from uh, Germany, Maruchi Yoshida, who is attended also in this uh, session and uh, others that uh, make it uh, possible to use uh, international uh, international funds because uh, we know that in time of crisis, a cultural heritage can easily be forgotten from the list of the budgets, and uh, it's uh, the, the um, you know uh, the decision makers didn't uh, look at the cultural heritage as a prop, uh, as a priority as an uh, essential element for community resilience. So uh, we need some help to help cultural heritage and make it uh, possible that cultural heritage can help us in reward. Uh, no, it was not an easy task, but uh, we did it. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I, see, so I think on, on how my end, what I can say I mean, one percent of the budget of Morocco's government goes to culture. One percent is very little. So I think, and for us, very quickly, uh, we understood that we just had to do it ourselves. You know, like we just had, we created the music school. Uh, we looked for funding. We volunteered. We're just a, a bunch of friends with a local community member who's an activist, and I think it was an activist project. If I don't think one should be waiting for any support, and only once we developed the project, found uh, partners, international partner in the US and, and, and Holland, and, you know, and uh, suddenly we got uh, recognition. And finally, I think this is when uh, local institutions start to be interested in, in our project as a pilot project. But that was our idea from the beginning. We wanted to do an example that then can be easily replicated, can be built easily, uh, and that can have like a, like a larger impact. So a small pilot project that if it's repeated could have a much, you know, like larger impact than itself. So collaboration was not easy. We had some partners that did a lot of damage in the small village that we brought that we actually had to part it with. Uh, we learned, it was a process where we learned a lot. Uh, and, and I think that the friendship, I would say that uh, it was not on a professional level, it was a volunteer project. We all had shared the same passion and the same values, and we created this non-for-profit that then could lead this project. And I never thought that as an architect and a professor, I went there doing research, uh, like an uh, academic research, that this, that I would be led to be one of the co-founders of this, you know, of NGO today, and, and now creating other music schools in Africa. So, Anyways, using the same model. So it's interesting. You start one way and end up another way. Fantastic. I have one more question that all moderators have been asked to ask their sessions. So I will I will ask it and you're welcome to answer it in any direction you would you would like to go um, with partnerships or your, your particular project. And the question is from the work that you do. And from some of the any of the themes that you've seen throughout this conference, if you've had a chance to join other sessions, what to you are, are the most needed next steps, either for innovation or for the particular situation that you're going? What do we need next? Funding partnerships. Um, how do we support more innovation and and creativity? I think people in the global south should. Feel, start to feel more confident in, in, the, in their own skills. I think for the longest time we've been waiting for the global north to fund us, to give us legitimacy in what we do. Now there are many of us that are very well educated that um, need in a way to bring back like a contribution. And I think that there is a, like this is a moment where I think one needs to act even if in a very small scale 
I think waiting for funding might never happen. It's like waiting for Godot. So um, climate change issues are very urgent. And like we've seen with Alex and, you know, like it's, we should not be waiting for a moment of disaster to act. We all need to act now and, and feel co confident about acting at, at any scale possible that we can. Yeah, I, um, if I may, I, I would like to add, uh, as as rightly pointed out by, uh, by the presenters, uh, the climate change is real and disasters are going to happen. That, like we can't stop them. But uh, as uh, mentioned by the Shahzad, uh, people preserve the culture and not science and technology. And while while she was actually presenting the, the uh, there are the things like uh, they can't connect to the projects or uh, the cultural heritage because of the like. I personally feel the ownership. Uh, they can't. They are not able to own the uh, thing. Like they can't understand because the ownership. So for that, I, I personally feel that uh, uh, we as a professional should uh, understand that the ownership will be coming through the. We need to understand them rather than the uh, imposing, emphasizing our knowledge to them. So it is not going to come in a day or two. We have to see how the culture or uh, tradition is getting built up over the years, how they are behaving, why they are behaving. So that that's uh, that's our learning from project also. So that's that's from my side. Like we need to really look into that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And from my point of view, I think the next. Is uh, step would be uh, introducing the cultural heritage meaning to the children and young generation because uh, I think they can if they know what we are talking about what it is uh, what it means and what uh, what variety possibility lay on the cultural heritage for living uh i think children and a young generation can affect also the older ones and the parents and the society uh, finally to take care of uh, the cultural heritage and make it possible and let the cultural heritage take care of them so uh children and young generation are uh the most important target of every cultural activity, well, in my uh, point of view. Right, that's, that's very powerful. Thank you, Sharzad. Um, Alex, do you have thoughts to add? Well, you know, uh, as climate change emerges as the global emergency of this century, it will have broad sweeping uh, impacts on culture and environment throughout the globe. Uh, first, we need to recognize that it's happening. Uh, you know, we can all act individually uh, to make these small changes and impacts. But at a, at a higher level, uh, there needs to be <laughs> There needs to be some action. You know, we're talking massive governmental action uh, to try to right the ship here. Uh, we are heading down the wrong road. Um, the writing's on the wall, and, and it's this, this slow moving disaster we're all observing on, on different scales from fire to pandemics to uh, uh, sea level rise. I mean, if you, if you think about archaeology and sea level rise, all of the coastal sites in the world, all of the coastal archeological sites in the world are expected to be destroyed in about the next 50 years. I mean, there, this is a massive problem. Um, so, you know, I, I think we, we need to act on different scales, uh, both, you know, in our very specific uh, professions, but also um, at a massive scale, governmental, uh, international scale to start writing these things. And, and that would be our carbon footprint, uh, the things we consume, the source of the problem, right? You know, uh, let's act that way, but let's also, let's be proactive and reactive. So, you know, it, it, in a sense, me going into a wildfire disaster is reactive, but the source of the problem 
is our carbon footprint and the way we live, right? So I think we have, and we really need to act on different scales. And this is generational, um, you know, so our, our children and their children really need to understand the problem, but also need to take action. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and I'll, I'll just as a final capstone, what I'm hearing from some of the my colleagues who have been working with the youth forums and the youth sessions throughout this conference is, um, as Sharzad said, um, they are very engaged and they have different approaches to heritage and they have they have values for it that are not sort of the ones that I know my generation sort of inherited from previous. They are more open and really looking to engage with it and. We tried to pull out in the open, the inaugural session, the issue of transformation and where can heritage start to plug into some of that transformation that we need. Um, that we've gone a bit over time and we have a wonderful presentation uh, to go from Nancy. So I'm just gonna say thank you so much for your presentations and all of your work on these amazing projects. They are, lit, they are so inspiring and they're so different, but you just did a beautiful job of interrelating all of them. So thank you so much. Um, for our multimedia presentation, we have Nancy Odegaard, who is joining us from Arizona, I believe, with a multimedia presentation on the significance of Mission San Javier del Bac. Uh, so, Nancy and Jui, over to you to share Nancy's uh, presentation. Yes, uh, absolutely. But I think uh, first I would invite Dr. Nancy to tell us a few words. I, uh, and I would like to actually introduce Dr. Nancy Odegaard, who's from the Arizona State Museum of the University of Arizona, as uh, Marcy said. She is a retired head of preservation at the Arizona State Museum in Tuscan, where she is also a faculty professor in the departments of anthropology, material science and engineering, and the American Indian studies. Her own advanced studies is in the conservation were completed at the Smithsonian Institution and her doctorate degree is from the University of Canberra in Australia. She's a fellow of the uh, AIC and IIC. She is also well known for many articles and books as well as lectures and workshops in over 20 countries. Among her many awards, Nancy has also uh, have been an ICROM fellow in 2015 and was awarded an honorary doctorate from the Faculty of Science and University of Gothenburg, Sweden in 2016. I would now like to invite Dr. Uh, Dr. Nancy to introduce her video and then we will uh, look at the multimedia film. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here today. Our project illustrates the role of inclusion for attaining conservation solutions and reminds us that heritage is both living and evolving. Conservation at the Mission San Javier in Southern Arizona is a place-based story located about 97 kilometers north of the border with Mexico and a migration corridor. This nationally recognized historic building, arguably the most important one in the state of Arizona was begun in 1793 and includes unique artwork within a living Catholic church on the Tohono O'odham Indian Reservation that continues to serve the same community known as Wak that it was originally built for. Its location is the Sonoran Desert, an area that includes both Northwest Mexico, Baja California, and parts of the Southwestern United States. It's believed by naturalists to be the most diverse, biodiverse desert on earth. But climate change has reduced the snowpacks from the mountains that provide fresh water for the desert communities and about and uh, a 25 to 40 percent drop in precipitation has been seen over the past 50 years. Today our area sees more days of high temperature and drought as well as rare but sudden bursts of heavy rain and subsequent flooding. We understand that cultural heritage provides knowledge and practices that can improve how we do conservation. Since 1985, efforts at Mon Mission San Javier del Bac have been managed by the nonprofit organization known as the Patronato San Javier. Previous preservation uh, efforts have included numerous campaigns with variable success, including the inappropriate use of cement. Previous, um, recently, a new approach has been initiated and a conservation committee has formally addressed several topics. We strive to be more inclusive with the community 
to consider cultural concerns and establish priorities for projects. For example, we regularly meet with village elders and have included tribal members on the board of directors. We have engaged with the local University of Arizona for better research-based analysis of object materials and the proposed product, products for solutions. For example, a doctoral engineering student is studying the presence of microbes within the structure in order to better understand the environmental ecosystem and how it's changing in the building. We've established an apprenticeship program for tribal members. We have had three and one is now completing a university degree to become a professional conservator. We've formalized our contracts with architects and construction craftspeople, thereby being more transparent in the hires and the engagement of talent from more diverse sources, including Mexico. We have enhanced the role of the village-based conservation team who worked on site for over 20 years so that they may provide insight for all the projects. We have systematically researched historic photographs, documents, and records related to the conservation campaigns and have hired a preservation specialist to produce a comprehensive conservation management plan to guide all future work. We have created a resource team of the regional conservators that can share information on materials, tools, and techniques. So for some examples um, would be working on that you will see in the video, that is, um, the original church doors where the wooden objects conservator has developed a new modular cleaning solution that is safer for both the environment and the conservators. While working with village bell ringers and iron workers, I developed a new hanging method for bells to prevent further damage and was able to recover the names of the bells that were cast in but had become obscured by corrosion crusts. I should note bells are used only for feast days and for funerals. While cleaning polychrome sculptures, conservators have made technological and attribution discoveries. The mural paintings, conservators found and removed damaging repairs of the past and revealed many details not known before. While stabilizing the East Tower, conservation has included the tradition of using cactus juice in the lime plaster layers but has also introduced the new use of basalt rods and mesh to support areas of severe structural erosion. And finally, a team that includes colleagues from Mexico is currently conducting historical research, pigment analysis, and working in test areas on the ornamental facade. In this five, three minute video that is silent, I'll say a few words during it, you will see our collaborative conservation work in action. We're using science in new ways to monitor and address how the building and its artwork can continue to simultaneously serve the religiously faithful of the village and the many thousands of tourists that visit it each year. Thank you. And this is just information about the Patronato San Javier. Um, its sole purpose is to help with the Mission San Javier. We're located in the Sonoran Desert and the tribe has agriculture surrounding the actual building. It's bits of the village of Wac. And historic photos that have become useful for our conservation efforts. Slightly more recent photographs illustrating changes. The choir loft and the dome before treatment. And the dome more recently. These are the doors where wood conservators and the conservation team, in addition to the mission priest, um, have studied and installed. Here you can see a before and after the doors, the on-site conservation team, and here the paintings conservator, Matilde Rubio, who was originally from Spain, And our apprentice, Susie Moreno. 
the work includes both the murals, wall paintings, and the polychrome sculpture, as well as um, the base. This is Tim Lewis, one of the um, on-site conservators, also from the village. And um, the use of lighting, um, paint layered pigment identification. This is monitoring of the environment and the microbe study. This is uh, one of the bells and my team of students from the University of Arizona and in on site with the hanging using local villagers and uh, ma developing a maintenance program. And here is the scaffolding on our East Tower that is currently underway using craftsmen, both local and, and from Mexico, using traditional techniques, as well as introducing new methods to secure the structure. This is basalt mesh being inserted and our um, project manager for conservation. And finally, um, greetings from WAC. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nancy, for presenting all of that. It's, it's a really beautiful building. Um, I know we're close to time, but I will ask if anyone has an immediate question for Nancy uh, to please quickly put it in the chat or raise your hand. And I will ask one question uh, while we just pull those together. Nancy I hadn't realized that bells had names. Um, and I'm yeah. curious what some of the names are. Or is it is it acceptable to share them or are the names normally kept? No, um, they just had become uh, so obscured that people forgot they did have names. It was not all bells, church bells have names, but many do. And in um, New Spain, when the Franciscans and uh, before them, the Jesuits came in, they often brought bells uh, to use almost as clocks. And um, at the mission, we have four bronze bells. One is the San Augustine bell, that was originally at the Tucson Presidio or fort um, that was then given to San Javier. We have the uh, San Juan Batista bell. We have a San Pedro bell and we have a San Javier bell, which we believe uh, may have been cast on site. So these are bells that date to uh, from the earliest one we have is dated to 1775. Okay. That is great. What's thing. interesting about bells um, is that in working with them and working with the village, bell ringing is very important and um, is definitely a village activity. So we worked very closely with bell ringers because they're used for the feast days where they're rung exuberantly. Uh, for quite a bit of time and at funerals and the village can, everyone in the village can know if the deceased is a child, a male, a female, or a very important person. So ringing of the bells is not random. It's absolutely very specific mes messaging and the song that's played is uh, understood by the people there. That is so interesting. I hadn't known there was a language of the bells. That's, so that's it's been that. wonderful to um, be able to help them pres uh, preserve the bells as a, a small project in a uh, landscape that uh, and building that includes so much. Great. Um, I have a question that's coming in the chat. What is the general perspective held by local Native Americans about the building, its history, and preservation? Well, it is a living Catholic church and not all tribal members are parishioners of the Catholic church. Um, I think it's the building for this district of the Tawanon Nation is considered 
uh, a very important and a signature place. So it is um, respected and many do participate, but the idea of inclusion in what's going on, this is just like any community where people want to know what is happening, how fast it's happening and why they decided to do it that way. So this participation and dialogue has is a growing momentum and illustrates a, a way to prioritize and to better understand what details are important and what needs to be done in what order. So um, the building is, is arguably important to the tribe, um, but not religiously so for everyone. Yeah, so building and that's important to understand. Yeah, part of the community. Wonderful, thank you so much. Are there any remaining questions for Nancy? Not, um, Nancy, I'll say um, I did my graduate work at Tucson at the University of Arizona. And oh. so it's actually been, thank you so much. You're, you've reconnected me to part of my past because um, I haven't been there in quite a long time, but it was lovely to learn some new pieces about it. Great. So personal, well, thank you, as well as the much broader contribution. Sure. Well, please, please come back and visit again. <laughs> we'll try that. Um, with that, I think we will call it to a close. Um, just thank you again so much for all of the, the wonderful presentations um, and all of the good questions and discussion. And with that, we will wish you well and close the session for today. Mm -hmm.